Hello and welcome to another episode of Sci-Fi Night Ranking, where we rank our favorite movie series, TV shows, seasons, and so forth. As many of you know, I'm a die-hard X-Files fan. It's my favorite show, and I mostly love every single season in its own way for what it is. I've seen every episode several times, I love the comics, and for me, the truth will always be out there in the form of my adoration for this classic and super influential show. And with that, it's time to rank all the 11 seasons of The X-Files. So with each season, I'll be bringing up both good and bad aspects and episodes, and let's not wait any longer, let's get right to it. Alright, so let's kick it off with the number 11 spot, which goes to season 10, that returned in 2016 with a 6 episode miniseries after over a decade without The X-Files. Unfortunately, it was a really clunky return. Whoa, let's just keep this within the realm of the natural sciences, shall we? In this season, Mulder and Scully get tossed back into the FBI following some supposed alien abductees showing up, and it's once again time to saddle up and take on the paranormal. They said that you two have experience with these, um, spooky cases. So the mythology episodes didn't work at all and weren't very engaging. This was definitely affected by the fact that there were only six episodes, so the season never really found its stride. However, I do like that Mulder and Scully are older and more used to the paranormal now. Scientific fact. Mulder, the internet is not good for you. They've adapted over the years, and though they grew apart between seasons, their estranged son William draws them back together. And while their reunification is a little underwhelming, it's still wonderful to see. Well, it looks like this person was born without footprints. Which is impossible, by the way. The tone and feeling of season 10 is unfortunately a bit sterile and clean. There are exceptions and parts where the style works, like with episode 2, Founder's Mutation, but the classic X-Files atmosphere just wasn't really there. Couldn't you be jumping to conclusions? Okay, so to the best and worst of the season. So the mythology episodes are without a doubt the weaker episodes, but episode 5, Babylon, is definitely the worst by far. It manages to be both insensitive and simultaneously really silly with the world's most two-dimensional Islamic terrorists as the villains in a time where we're already super divided. The tone goes from horrible terrorist attack to wacky mushroom trip and none of it gels together. Just don't think you'd understand. Huge misfire here, the episode doesn't work at all. Founder's Mutation was a fun little throwback to some of the older mad scientist kind of stuff but exploiting psychic kids for their powers is a pretty old and overused trope of the X-Files at this point, and it really just felt cliché, even though I did like the opening. One of the best installments was Episode 4, Home Again. Despite the name being very misleading, the episode itself was like a classic Season 4 episode, dark and bloody, featuring a cool monster. And balanced out with the right amount of humor. And uh, his head is in a trash can here. Not even in the proper recycling bin. However, I could have done without some of the Scully family stuff going on, which I really just felt kind of detracted from a fun little monster episode. But I think the best episode of the season has to be the comedy episode written by Darren Morgan, Mulder and Scully Meet the Were Monster, which was really great and is honestly one of the best comedy episodes ever, where every single line of dialogue was well written, funny, and engaging. But you're not thinking of doing anything crazy, are you? No. I'm just gonna... kill you. Overall, it was really nice to see Mulder and Scully back in action, but despite some good stuff, Season 10 ended up being a pretty damn big disappointment and, I mean, truth be told, the worst season so far, and there's no one more sad to say that than me. You ran the X-Files. You were the X-Files. You all but wrote the book. I'm afraid that book is closed. So, the number 10 spot goes to Season 11, and I kind of hate saying that, to be honest. I feel like Season 11 had a lot of potential learning from the mistakes of Season 10. This time, they upped the number of episodes to 10, and there were definitely more good and fun episodes. While the mythology stuff is still really the weakest aspects, and honestly just feels forced, I thought they did a good job integrating their estranged son William into the season. I would have preferred this season just being standalone episodes, or maybe having some kind of larger villain reoccur here and there as a main antagonist, kind of like how Toombs and Donnie Faster both returned for later sequel episodes. I also feel like the overall tone and cinematography is just a little bit sharper and better than season 10. 
even if the episodes that aren't very good still have good production value and direction. Thanks for backing me up out there. Yeah, you're my homie. Once again, the first and last mythology episodes are really lame, just didn't work, and I wish they weren't there. Episode 6, Kitten, had the chance to tell an interesting A.D. Skinner-centric episode, but completely missed the mark, and instead made something incredibly boring. But this season actually has one of my most hated episodes ever, Episode 7, Followers. Me and my buddy Joseph Ari ranted about how much we hated this installment in an episode of Tipsy Talk, but overall this episode was just a complete misfire. It was so on the nose with its message and I just couldn't take anything in it seriously. There were a couple of interesting concepts, but overall this episode was just awful. Awfully boring and awfully misguided. Alright, so on to the good. I liked the evil doppelganger episode, plus one. Episode 9, Nothing Lasts Forever, was a fun little creepy crazy cult throwback, and Episode 5, Ghoulie, was a perfect combination of mythology and Monster of the Week, with a great performance from Miles Robin as Mulder and Scully's son. However, you cannot talk about Season 11 without talking about Episode 8, Familiar. He was in the forest. Oh man, was this episode fantastic. It follows the strange goings on in a small town in Connecticut as a child is tragically killed. And it's actually got a proper little mystery to it. Put the gun down. Rick. Put the gun down. It's okay. I got it. I got it. It's one of the scariest episodes of the X-Files ever made, it feels like a classic X-Files episode, it was dark, violent, took some risks in regards to content, and I just wish that writer Benjamin Van Allen had written the entire season. So while season 11 was an improvement over season 10 and overall has a better feel in production, it doesn't really have that X-Files magic, aside from episode 7 of course. There's no way for me to make you understand without me seeming like a crazy madman. It's a little late for that. The number 9 spot appropriately goes to season 9, the season that ended the show for over a decade. So this is probably the most universally hated season of the X-Files, or at least amongst the originals, and I don't really think it's that warranted. Okay, sure, it was the season with the least Mulder and Scully in it. Yes, it pushed Monica Reyes on us before we were ready to accept her as a member of the X-Files, and there were a lot of very flimsy and weird episodes. But those quirky ideas also gave the season a lot of identity, unique stories, and some of the best episodes of the later seasons. In terms of mythology, Season 9 continues the Super Soldier's plotline, but unfortunately doesn't really do it super well. And the series finale ended up being really underwhelming. It was even scientifically undeniable. Which unfortunately brought down the entire season in my opinion. If we can get past the Mulder thing, I do feel like there were a lot of great stories at the core of the season though. That actually took the show in a more abstract direction, and I really actually appreciate the different feel that this season has. It's also a bit brighter and more light-hearted. The deceased shot straight up through the roof, flew high into the air, and landed on his buddy's car. It'll be to see. We got to know Agent Reyes a lot more, though her character was still unfortunately very uninteresting. That was a pretty convincing show back there. She's play acting, Monica. Just because he's good at it doesn't make it true. But if you weren't a Doggett fan before, then you definitely would become one in Season 9, as we get some great episodes with him and his story arc revolving around the search for his son's killer is resolved in a fantastic way. Can I tell you, I think I'm finally getting the hang of this job. So, to the best and worst. Now, the thing is, I don't feel like Season 9 has a lot of terrible episodes per se, but it's more along the lines of the episodes being very dull and forgettable. Lord of the Flies feels like a misfire, the two first story episodes were super boring. You're making a big mistake here. And the finale didn't give us a definitive or exciting finish we wanted to the show. It was mostly just really lame. I don't see where this is going. Still though, the worst insult of all comes in the form of the episode Jump the Shark, an ill-fated end to the lone gunman in which the beloved characters are killed off in a really unsatisfying way. 
Long story. Never mind. However, that plot point ended up being changed for the comics, anyway. There were a lot of interesting and abstract themes that made up some of the season's best, though. Like the episode 4D, about a brutal killer who can travel between parallel worlds. My target would have called that crazy, too. But give me another theory that fits. Audrey Polly, where Agent Reyes must make her way out of a coma in a strange version of the hospital that her body is at and Scary Monsters, about a young boy who has terrible stuff happen around him and is much more than he seems to be. How's he doing? He's a hell of a lot calmer than I'd be. Also, who could forget Improbable, where the agents are after a serial killer and end up running into, well, God, played by Burt Reynolds. I know it sounds crazy, but it actually works and is one of the most entertaining episodes of the later seasons. The checkers are in the trunk, if either of you play. Sir, does it look like we're here to play checkers? No. For me, the highlight of Season 9 has to be Sunshine Days, though. Written and directed by Breaking Bad creator Vince Gilligan. In it, our agents follow the leads of a bizarre death and end up at a house owned by a strange man with strange obsessions, and the entire thing serves as an allegory for the X-Files itself and the everlasting search for the truth that is out there. Honestly, this episode ends the series better than the actual series finale and remains one of my favorites. So close, Nana. Sorry you don't get your proof. So basically the problems with Season 9 center around it being underwhelming, not having any confidence in itself, and not really having a lasting impact. People call it the sleepy season, and that's a very fair thing to say. I do feel like some people are way too critical just because Mulder and Scully aren't in it as much, but I do like the alternative tone that the season takes, and regardless of what others say, I still do enjoy season 9, but it is definitely among the worst of the seasons. I need something good. Something amazing. Something really cool. I don't know what you mean. Alright, the number 8 spot goes to Season 7, perhaps the most confused and unfocused season ever. So after that the X-Files movie was released and Season 6 wrapped up a lot of the alien mythology storyline, that left Season 7 without any real identity, without really knowing what it wanted to do. All while the show's creators didn't even know if a show would continue. The main story focus ended up being around Mulder's search for his sister, and though I do find the episode closure to be very emotionally touching, to be honest, it does feel a bit underwhelming as well after seven years of searching. As hard as that is to admit, I wanted to find her here riding her bike like all these other kids. This left us with some pretty flimsy and off episodes I don't really enjoy, like Hollywood AD and The Amazing Malini, but there are of course real gems in there as well, as with every season. Well, it certainly would appear that way, but the question is how? The tone of the season is a bit off and unclear, but I would say definitely a little religious or spiritual, which was interesting at least. Thank you, God! Episodes like Orison and Signs and Wonders centered around both divine power and will as well as personal faith, and the episode All Things came down to a crisis of faith for Scully, not just religiously, but in terms of faith in her career and life choices. However, you can tell that there were production problems behind the scenes. The season really struggles to find an identity, which is unfortunate, as it was the last season to feature Agent Mulder full-time. The season starts off with some new mythology regarding ancient alien spacecrafts that makes us question our place in the universe, and I actually like this mythology stuff to begin with, but it doesn't really pay off. No. How many times can I say it? So, to the best and worst of the season. Why is season 7 so high up on the list? Well, it has two of the worst episodes ever. Fight Club and First Person Shooter, about doppelgangers causing destruction. You know what they say, everyone has a twin out there somewhere. And an evil video game that kills people. Yeah, you heard that right. Okay. These are two episodes that just don't work at all. The action is underwhelming and the humor misses the mark. There's a reason fans hate these two episodes with a passion. Well, I thought I was on to something. Also, the crossover with the show Millennium was okay at best, but definitely a disappointing finish to the Millennium series. No thank you. And there are quite a few forgettable episodes that I do find charming in a classic X-Files way, 
but that don't really do anything new. Now to the good stuff, so there's actually a lot to like here, I mean of course, there's a lot to like in almost every season. X-Files veteran and Breaking Bad creator Vince Gilligan gave us the episode Hungry, an episode shown from a monster's point of view and it's just flat out great. What's your point? I'm just tying up some loose ends. Two wonderfully spooky and dark episodes are Thief, about some creepy voodoo stuff going on, and the previously mentioned Signs and Wonders, about some very poisonous and mystic religious extremism. Repent! Pray for the Lord's quickening power! Chimera is a pretty underrated and overlooked episode about some kind of vengeful witchcraft going on, with an unexpected ending. The season finale, Requiem, is actually pretty damn good in my opinion and could easily have been an end to the series. But X-Cops, a combination of X-Files and Cops, is just great. With all due respect, what the f are you talking about? It's one of the best comedy episodes ever and the writing, once again by Vince Gilligan, is just perfect. Mulder, have you noticed that we're on television? I don't think it's live television, Scully. She just said Overall, Season 7 ends up being too unsure of what it wants to be. We get some great, very self-referential stuff that flips the concept a bit, like Hungry and X-Cops, but Season 7 has too little excellence to be higher regarded and unfortunately ends up being kind of forgettable. Sorry. It's okay. Excuse me. At the number 7 spot, we give a season that started it all, Season 1. Alright, so season 1 is obviously classic, we wouldn't be here without it, and I truly love it. Now that's the credential, rewriting ice. But honestly, it's flawed and doesn't always hold up as well as later seasons. Obviously, season 1 introduces us to Mulder, Scully, Deep Throat, Skinner, the cigarette smoking man, the lone gunman, and it started developing the series structure. It was a magic season that gave us a show we all know and love. The thing is though, for all the great classic episodes like Squeeze, Ice, EBE, and Beyond the Sea, there's also episodes ranging from a kind of lame, like the killer computer system in Ghost of the Machine, the sort of tired, like the body switching in Lazarus, or the not so friendly ghost in Shadows, to the flat out terrible episodes like the Jersey Devil, or one of my least favorite episodes ever, Space. <laughs> You can really tell that the whole cast and crew were still kind of finding their way and getting everything to work, as we see so much unrealized potential. The effects and budget was hardly at its peak, with quite a few cheap moments, but overall they did the best they could with what they had. While the season as a whole is a little clunky and uneven, it still laid the groundwork for what we all know and love and still delivered a ton of classic episodes and moments, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get a lot of hate from the X-Files fans for putting season 1 so low on the list. That guy's insane. So to the best and worst. Now the worst I already mentioned, it's Space, an episode about the fucking Mars space possessing astronauts. Yeah, I'm not fucking kidding. <gasps> The best for me though is a chuff choice, because there are a lot of great episodes. The season finale is fantastic. Ice, while very similar to John Carpenter's The Thing, is a truly great episode too. Mulder! Scully, get that gun off me! Mulder, you have to understand! Put it down! You put it down first! Scully! But for the best, I gotta go with Beyond the Sea. An episode that's dark, deep, beautiful, bittersweet, and so goddamn well made. In it, Mulder and Scully come into contact with a man on death row with psychic visions that end up helping them catch a serial killer. His eyes cold, very cold, staring at Elizabeth. God, he's got the wire. No, please, no. So overall, season one is great in what it manages to achieve, but there's a lot that it doesn't really pull off as well as it should. It's a great season, but things do definitely get better. Do you believe in the existence of extraterrestrials? That brings us to the number six spot, which goes to season six. So the sixth season starts off after the feature X-Files film, and it has a lot to handle and wrap up. That said, it, much like season 7, suffers from being a bit too unfocused in both mythology and overall themes. Is there going to be data to back this vague omnibus account? Yes. 
So without having as much of a structured mythology this time around, Season 6 experimented with some different formats and went in some different and interesting directions. This we see with the episode Drive, about a man who has to travel at a certain speed to survive. You're going the wrong way. What do you mean it's the wrong way? No, sorry, go this, this way, go this way! I can't, I can't go, that's, I can't go left, there's only trees there. And Monday about a day that keeps on repeating over and over again until Mulder can figure out how to stop it. I just really like a lot of the ideas in Season 6, as with Terms of Endearment, where the villain may not be all you think, and Milagro, about a writer whose fiction comes to life, and the mythology episodes killed off the syndicate and closed a chapter of the ongoing alien conspiracy. Can you dispose of this problem? Yes. So overall the season is a little spotty in terms of tone, but somehow it just really worked for me. They did some interesting stuff with the standalone episodes, and some pretty cool stuff with the mythology. Okay, so to the good and the bad, well, there's not really a single episode that I truly dislike to be honest. I mean, Dreamland doesn't work for me, but I know a lot of X-Files fans love it. The Rain King is kind of cheesy, but also a nice little feel-good episode. I guess Alpha, the killer dog episode, gets a lot of hate, but I mean, I don't know, I think it's alright. And there are some very standard Monster of the Week episodes that don't really take any risks or doing anything new, like Aguamala or Trevor. Then on the flip side, I think Season 6 has a lot of really fantastic episodes that bring up a lot of new, interesting ideas. Aside from Drive, Monday, and Milagro, we also get Triangle, the most grand and operatic episode ever, bringing up time travel and the Bermuda Triangle, and utilizing very few cuts. So you're saying that the Queen Anne just disappeared? Into the Bermuda Triangle. And reappeared this morning at 6.49 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's impossible. It's such a unique episode that I truly adore. Also, we can't forget Tithonus, which is one of my top 20 best episodes about a man who always manages to be around when somebody dies. She's a smoker, she might die of lung cancer. The how is always a surprise. I, I just always know when. Overall, Season 6 has the odds stacked against it, but has enough interesting ideas to keep the show going. But you believed me. In your dreams. Alright, on to our number 5 spot, Season 2. So, after Season 1 presented the world of the X-Files, Season 2 definitely improved it. Lovely. In my opinion, the production was just completely elevated, and this is where the show started to get really, really good. In it, the X-Files have been shut down following the ending of Season 1, and our favorite agents need to fight to get the truth back. They don't want us working together, Scully. And right now, that's the only reason I can think of to stay. So, Season 2 feels a bit more polished and a little darker than Season 1, yet it introduced the first comedy episode ever, in the form of a now classic humbug, about strange murders taking place in and around a freak show. He eats live animals. He eats anything. Live animals, dead animals, rocks, light bulbs, corkscrews, battery cables, cranberries. The season did have some production problems, such as Gillian Anderson had to leave the show to give birth, However, this led to the episode Dwayne Barry and Scully's abduction, which would become a central part of the overall mythology. What really began the mythology in earnest, or, or kicked it into a higher gear anyway, was when Gillian Anderson got pregnant at the end of the first season, they had to account for her absence. So the writers came up with the idea that she would be abducted by aliens. Basically everything was upped from season one, and the alien conspiracy mythology really started getting amped up and began feeling like blockbuster episodes. So, to the best and worst of a season. So, despite being an overall upgrade from season one, season two had a couple of shitty episodes. This is a serious allegation, Agent Muller. Such as Fearful Symmetry about invisible animals and Dud Calm about really bad old people makeup. Now, these stand out as not just bad, but also pretty boring episodes. What's my next punishment? Scrubbing the bathroom floors with a toothbrush? Luckily, there's so much more good stuff. Well, then you damn well better have the facts to back it up. From fun and entertaining episodes like Blood, about people in a small town going crazy, the great murder mystery in Red Museum, and the cannibal chaos in our town, to excellent classics like the iconic monster episode The Host. Mulder, this is amazing. Seminal serial killer episode Irresistible, and the straight up horror hour in Die Hand die Verletzt. In the name of the Lords of Darkness, rulers of the Earth, kings of the Underworld, 
and of course Anasazi, the episode that elevated the alien conspiracy mythology to the next level. But these aren't humans, Scully. From the look of it, I'd say they were alien. It's also just an overall standout episode that steals the show for season two. Oh my god, Scully. What have they done? Overall, Season 2 did exactly what it should have, improved upon all the groundwork that was laid before it, expanded the story, characters, and mythology, and led us to a season that did something both familiar and new. As of right now, I'm reopening the X-Files. And number 4, we get to Season 8, and I can already feel the fire from some people's keyboards raining hate down on me. How dare I rank this season so high since Mulder is barely in it? How dare I accept Agent Doggett as a member of the X-Files? Well, that's just wrong. Alright, hardcore X-Files fans, hear me out before you dislike the video. So, the X-Files evolved as a show, and as Mulder left and Agent Doggett joined, the dynamic of the show changed, and in my opinion, did so well. Agent Doggett would be pretty much the opposite to Mulder. My experience, dead men don't tip, Agent Scully. You want me to think like Scully and Mulder would. You got the wrong guy. I need facts, not wild ideas. I'm sorry, Dr. Burks. You're, a uh... You're a professor of what? A down-to-earth, street-smart, by-the-book guy whose ideas and limited knowledge of the paranormal would come at odds with Scully, who, after several years of strange cases, had turned more and more into a believer. So what do you think, Agent Scully? Haunted hotel room? Alien invaders? Sloppy vampires? It's a theory, Agent Scully, but to my mind and pretty much the rest of me, it, it doesn't work. Having Scully being the believer was something we'd seen just a little bit in earlier seasons, such as in the great episode Beyond the Sea, but here she embraced it much more and became a true veteran of the X-Files, flying the paranormal flag. I'd say it's wise you keep an open mind. And I'll admit that it's hard to accept. But there is a motive, and there is a pattern, and there is a reason. And we will see it not working like this. She does this along with her new partner, who she didn't at all get along with at first, but Doggett gains her trust throughout the season, and the way that their relationship develops is truly wonderful to see. Mulder, when he shows up, would obviously come at odds with Doggett. We're both in the same boat, Agent Doggett, we're just paddling in different directions. No, we're not going in different directions here, we're going in one direction, my direction. If you got information important in this investigation, I damn well better know about it. I'm in charge out here, Agent. All right, then go ahead and take charge. Only you might not like what it means in this case. And you'd love to help, but you left your lightsaber at home. But even they would manage to get past her differences. Answer the phone, Agent Doggett. You're in charge here now. Another great point, season eight is dark. One of the darkest seasons the X-Files have ever done, if not the darkest, as we don't hold back on blood, gore, and violence. <laughs> Episode 4, Roadrunners, but a fucked up small town cult, is intense and interesting with gross stuff. The episode Badla features an Indian sorcerer demon thing that crawls inside people and then does its best alien impression. The episode Dead Alive features a skin shitting sequence that was brilliantly gross and via negativa is just a straight up hour of sheer bloody horror. They're all dead. Season 8 definitely feels darker and more horror based. In my opinion, it was a very welcome change that made the season stand out a bit. This is extreme. This brings us to the worst and best. So, I actually pretty much like all the episodes of Season 8, but I do think that the weakest episode is Medusa, about a strange virus spreading the Boston subway tunnels. The best episode could easily have been the fantastic episode of The Gift, which will make anyone an Agent Doggett fan. I'm asking you and your men to get out of my way. You can't take it, Agent Doggett. It belongs to us. This is a man. He didn't belong to anybody. The Mulder Doggett buddy cop feeling of Yenen was a lot of fun, and the season finale was fantastically violent and action packed, featuring the long awaited death of that slimy asshole Alex Krychek, 
However, the best of the season from Evo goes to Via Negativa, one of the creepiest and best produced episodes ever, about a cult leader capable of entering a higher plane of existence by entering people's dreams and then brutally murdering them. Overall, Season 8 feels new, fresh, dark, and raw. Alongside Scully, we're thrust into the search for Mulder as newer, bloodier dangers await around every corner. I think it's the most underrated and overlooked season of the X-Files, and it's without a doubt one of my favorites. Thank you for watching my back. Well, I never saw it as an option. I'm sure you don't either. This brings us to the third spot and Season 5. Oh man, Season 5 was the X-Files at its most popular, when everyone was tuning in to see what our favorite FBI agents were up to every week. And obviously the quality of the season kept people hooked. Marty Glenn, 28. We found her at the scene doing a Formula 409. Under normal circumstances, my department would have her dead to rights. It just... One little snack. She's been blind since birth. In the fifth season, the X-Files had really found its stride, and they were working on making the X-Files movie while also shooting the season. Having found their style, they decided to try some different things out of necessity, which made the world of the X-Files much deeper. Like giving us the episode Unusual Suspects, that gave us the backstory for fan favorites for Lone Gunman. What do you need me to do? Just watch and learn. As well as Travelers, an episode that explored the early days of the X-Files in the 1950s. The men that Edward Skur killed 38 years ago. Was my father involved? How? Basically, I feel like Season 5 really just expanded the world of the X-Files in some very interesting ways. Okay, so let's weed out the good and the bad stuff. Every season has its lame episodes, and Season 5 is no different. No, I just think you're wrong. Kill Switch starts off really interesting about a self-aware computer program, but unfortunately gets really silly really fast. Scully! <laughs> Season 3's villain, Robert Patrick Modell, was a great and beloved antagonist, but his return in the sequel episode Kitsunegari just didn't work at all. I'd like to know why. However, overall, most of the episodes are pretty damn solid, perhaps without as many standout classics as some of the other seasons. Aside from this, we got some really solid mythology episodes, some of the absolute best. Who do you work for? Your mother? You work for him? You an old Smokey? Is that who put this together? You're going down for this, Spender. I'm going to see you prosecuted for murder. You watch me. Watch it happen. Like the two-parter Patient X and the Red and the Black, which are probably the scariest mythology episodes ever, too. Help me! Please! Help me! And let's not forget Bad Blood, one of the best comedy episodes ever, showing us how Mulder and Scully see each other. Hope you brought your cowboy boots. You want us to go to Dallas? Yeehaw! Actually, a town called Chaney, about 50 miles south of there, population 361. By all accounts, very rustic and charming, but as of late, ground zero, the locus for a series of mysterious nocturnal exsanguinations. Why don't you tell me the way you think it happened? I hope you brought your cowboy boots. Why are we going to Dallas? It's, actually, it's a little town just south of there called Cheney, Texas. Uh, they've had some incidents down there recently, which I think you'll agree are pretty unusual. Like what? The Pine Bluff variant, which skips everything paranormal in favor of domestic terrorism and almost feels like a mini-movie. And other really solid episodes like Detour, about some strange things happening in the woods. All Souls gives us another episode that tackled religious mythology, and Folie à deux, about a monster that only a few people can see, is one of the better standalone episodes ever made. Hello? Hello? Some people feel like this season is all filler for the feature film that followed, but I disagree. I think this was a season that truly added a lot of depth to the universe of the X-Files, and for that, I love it. They say this cat's shaft is a bad mother. Shut your mouth. I'm talking about shafts. 
I did not. This means that the second spot goes to Season 3. Alright, so where Season 2 got a bit darker and heavier than the previous season, Season 3 retained the seriousness and weight of the mythology, but also got lighter and introduced a lot of the humorous elements that would become more common as the series went on. Bambi also has this theory I've never come across. Who? Dr. Barenbaum. Her name is Bambi? Story-wise, the season picked up with an explosive resolution to the mysteries of Season 2, which made the alien mythology storyline even deeper, and the cigarette-smoking man got even more evil and interesting. There is a small matter of concern with the FBI, but we'll handle that internally as usual. The media attention will amount to nothing more than a few uh, scattered obituaries. We also got the episode Avatar, our very first episode focusing on fan favorite Walter Skinner. She was there with me, watching me. As I was watching myself dying, my blood spilling from a hundred different places. Scully's Catholic faith gets confronted in Revelations, and both Jack Black and Giovanni Ribisi make on-screen appearances before gaining famous in the episode DPO. There's another slight problem. She's married to your boss. Maybe I could fry him. Dude, he's your boss. Not if his daddy won't be. <laughs> Season 3 probably has the best mythology episodes and a tone that feels very well balanced, once again improving upon the previous season. Overall, it just kind of feels like the episodes all blend into each other very well. And I won't have you or anyone else suggesting otherwise. So, now to the best and worst. On the bad end of the spectrum we find episodes like Hell Money, an episode with a fantastic cast like Lucy Liu and B.D. Wong, and an interesting setting, but a really lame and sleepy execution. However, I would say that the definite worst goes to Tesso dos Bichos about a shaman who controls killer cats. Yeah, I don't know what they were thinking or smoking with that one. <laughs> Guys, if this turns out to be killer cats, I'm gonna be very disappointed. On the awesome end, there's almost too much to list. Check out literally any mythology episode, especially the two-part episodes Nisei and 731. Too Shy is a really underrated mutant monster episode, and how could we possibly forget Pusher, about the killer Robert Patrick Modell, who can persuade his victims to do almost anything. I need you to do something for me. The crowning achievement of the season once again goes to writer Darren Morgan and the episode Clyde Brookman's Final Repose, where a serial killer murdering psychics forces Mulder and Scully to come into contact with a man who can actually see how people are going to die. And it's my favorite episode of The X-Files ever. Well, you see, that's another reason I can't help you catch this guy. I might adversely affect the fate of the future. I mean, his next victim might be the mother of the daughter whose son invents the time machine. And the sun goes back in time and changes world history. Overall, this is a really solid season that many have as their number one spot. And while it's excellent, I do prefer the more refined style that we get from our number one spot. Do you want to know how you're going to die? Yeah, yes, I would. No, you don't. All right, the crowning achievement of the X-Files goes to season four. Ah, oh, hell yeah, this was the darkest season of the X-Files before season 8 came along with buckets of blood to challenge that. Story-wise, the mythology really heated up, and it was in the excellent standalone episode Leonard Betts that we learned that Scully got cancer as a result of her abduction in season 2. This ends up bringing Mulder and Scully closer together, which is necessary for him to make it through many dark mysteries, like the serial killer with a supernatural connection in Unruhe, the bloody cursed hospital of Sanguinarium, or, of course, Home, the first ever X-Files episode to be banned from reruns due to violence, as Mulder and Scully take on the fucked up redneck peacock family in a small town. On top of that, the critically acclaimed episode Musings of a Cigarette Smoking Man gave us not just a backstory, but also a lot of sympathy for the show's main villain. What did you find? Possibly everything. Maybe his background, who he is, and who he wants to be. Season 4 really tested Mulder and Scully, and it's these very serious struggles that I feel elevate this season as a whole. 
There are some funny episodes, like Small Potatoes, but overall this season feels a bit more serious, focused, and hard, giving the season a lot of identity and a sense of purpose. Everything just feels more important and gives a lasting impression. This is just one bomb I'm sitting on here. You didn't ask me how many more I know about. Now, the season isn't perfect, of course, as we will see in the good and the bad. So that makes it legitimate? Look at that. Unrequited, about a man out for revenge who can turn invisible, doesn't fulfill its potential and ends up being mostly kind of boring. El Mundo Gira is a pretty universally hated episode that is mostly just lame, and while a lot of people really like the episode Never Again, I can't stand it. I mean, it's a story about an evil tattoo. Yeah, why do people like this episode? Go ahead, treat yourself. This girl is a real doll. But beauty's only skin deep, baby. I go all the way to the bone. These duds can't really hold back the remaining excellence of the season, though. Every single mythology episode is top notch, and it probably has the best Monster of the Week episodes. Paper Hearts is a realistic, dark, and deeply personal story involving a serial killer and Mulder's sister. You choose the one that was your sister, and I'll tell you where she is. Elegy uses a spooky ghost and premonition story as a creepy way to confront Scully's mortality and cancer. And on top of all of the other really great episodes I've already mentioned, there are some vastly underrated episodes like Synchrony and Kaddish. However, of course, Episode 2, Home, is the best episode of Season 4 and one of the best episodes ever made. It's dark, deep, and hard-hitting and truly encapsulates what is so great about the entire season. At the same time, I knew we couldn't stay hidden forever. And one day the modern world would find us and my hometown would change forever. This season, for me anyway, is a season that says and does the most for our main characters and it just so happens to do it in a dark and violent yet incredibly stylish package. For me, season 4 will always be number 1. What we had here was proof, Scully, there's no way it could be anything else. So, that about does it for this episode of Sci-Fi Night Ranking, we hope you enjoyed it. And hey, if you've got a different ranking of the X-Files seasons, instead of just sending me hate, how about letting me know what your top 11 list looks like? Yeah, by all means, post your list in the comments below, it's always really fun to talk with fellow X-Files fans about some of the best and worst aspects of the show. But what you can't question is the science! So, that about does it for this episode of Sci-Fi Night, stay safe, and we'll catch you guys next time. Oh my god, Mulder. It smells like... I think it's bile. Is there any way I can get off my fingers quickly without betraying my cool exterior?